Today, you will run the gamut of artisanal craft brewers, people that are literally brewing with a one barrel system, 31 gallon system, all the way up to folks that are producing 30, 40, 50,000 barrels a year. It's amazing how much the industry has expanded. Hops over the past five years, barley over the past five years, the brewing industry just in Wisconsin has increased probably at least 15%. If you define growth as the number of breweries in existence, then I think there, I think most of the growth is going to happen at the small end of the market. My name is Peter Gentry. I own One Barrel Brewing Company in Madison, Wisconsin, and we brew literally one barrel of beer at a time, sell it primarily in our tap house. If you talk about the number of barrels being produced, the, the growth is all going to happen at the, at the high end. What steered me away from going bigger was financing. I couldn't get it. And second, my feeling that perhaps the market for mid-level breweries was starting to saturate. There are only so many taps and so much shelf space in any given market. The surprising part for me is our main revenue generator is just people that are coming and looking for a neighborhood bar that is maybe a little different than what uh, whatever else the neighborhood has to offer. In the early 1980s is really when craft beer began and so a lot of the breweries that we think of as the grandfathers of the craft beer movement, the Sierra Nevadas, the Anchors, Sam Adams, Capital Brewery even, Sprecher Brewery, these breweries all started in the early to mid 1980s during the first renaissance. The second began in approximately 2001, maybe we could scoot it up to about 2004, 2005. There's an awareness of the consumer now that is driving the demand for producers to use locally derived ingredients. And it's great for the industry and the state. We do get some of our hops locally. We get some from Gorsa Valley and some from the Wisconsin Hop Exchange. We sometimes use fruit in some of our beers, which we'll get locally. In the fall months, we use a lot of honey that we get from a local purveyor. We brew between uh, 200 and 250 barrels per year, and uh, that puts us in the nano brewery level. I use all the local ingredients I can. Um, today we've got uh, squash bug pale ale. I use butternut squash grown in Columbus. Our grains mostly come from Brees, which is in Chilton, Wisconsin. We use honey from just outside of Wisconsin. We're a brew pub. We also do distribution. We're hoping to do up to a thousand barrels annually. We have one farmer that we're working with. Uh, he's doing corn for us in our, uh, our American lager. We plan to do about 70% of uh, Wisconsin hops. We're a brew pub. The majority of our income comes from food sales and bar sales. We also make beer in-house, quite a bit of it. So the largest proportion of the beer we sell at our bar is our own. We favor Gorst Valley Hops, which is Maisel Maney, Wisconsin, just west of here. We grow some of our own hops as well. Uh, we've started using Gentle Breeze Honey, which is Mount Horeb, again just west of Madison, uh, for our honey ale. Uh, we like to use Breeze Malting when we can. That's Chilton, Wisconsin. And we have used some nice Wisconsin barley from South Shore. And we uh, do get some of our barrels for barrel aging turned through the Yahara Bay Distillery, which is here in Madison, too. So we try to support local businesses and agriculture when we can. All the base malt that we use in all of our beers uh, is barley that we grow ourselves, or barley that's grown for us in the Ashland area. Since uh, 2007, we've made an investment in growing hops in Wisconsin. Right now, we're about 25% of the hops that we use in our beers are Wisconsin grown. In 2007, hops and barley commodity prices soared. They soared in response to market forces that were about weather related, they were about acreage related, they were about all those kind of uh, influences on commodity pricing. We saw a 30% increase in grain prices. We saw maybe 150% increases in, in hop prices. One of the answers to that problem was to do it ourselves. And I took off in 2007 with a few other people, but concentrated on barley initially here in the northern Wisconsin region. Uh, we did some hop projects down south and those kind of projects now have filtered their way back into how I approach uh, that commodity as well here in the northern part of the Wisconsin.
We started off at fairly small level with a couple uh, 10 or 12 acres on my own property. It's now expanded into hundreds of acres. From that simple beginnings of maybe 11 or 12 acres at my own home has turned into a couple hundred acres here in northern Wisconsin. This was planted in mid to late June, which is about a month behind our, our target dates of mid-May. And then once we planted the seed, it just sat there in cold ground for, for it seemed like for weeks. This is not very tall by any kind of barley standards at all. These are fairly short. There should be at least twice, maybe three times the size of that head. But it's what we got to deal with. We would love to see, you know, 50 to 60 bushels uh, an acre out of here, but I have a feeling we'll be a little bit less than that as well. We need to make our, our barley production on a more consistent base and equal out to 80 to 100 bushels an acre. The mulster that we use, or any mulster that we've been uh, contracting with, requires a minimum amount of 180,000 pounds delivered to them to do a batch, which it turns out to be a rail car. So that's our target every year, is a rail car full of barley. And that takes about 200 acres to do that. We're fortunate that the city of Ashland still has a transloading facility, a public transloading facility, where I'm able to basically get a rail car in there, uh, load it myself, and ship the rail car off to the maltster. Once the raw barley comes in, it gets graded, so it's only the plump kernels that are going away to the maltster to get transformed into, into barley malt. And then the malt that comes back is properly stored for us to use throughout the year. I'm Matt Sweeney and I grow hops. This is a hops plant and these things will grow as tall as the trellis as I can build them but uh, they will grow 30 feet and higher and uh, come end of August beginning of September uh, we come out here and pick all the cones to make beer out of them. Each plant produces about a pound or two which translates into a, about a barrel of regular beer and a stronger beer like an IPA can take up to around 10 pounds of hops. We give the hop plants a support trellis and then we put string up in the spring and they spend the whole summer climbing the, the string. They actually twist in a clockwise fashion following the sun. Well, the hops have really taken a beating with the extreme temperature changes this past week. We've gone from 70 down to below 30 into freezing temperatures at night so we can really see the wilting but uh, they are hybridized in order to be strong and stay healthy even with infection. Hops give me an opportunity to demonstrate sustainability. I do things like hand picking off caterpillars instead of using pesticides and we do things like using mulch to cover up weeds as opposed to using herbicides. So from an environmental standpoint, I try to realize that this is a little environment that I've put the hop yard in and trying to be friendly with the, the neighbors that already live here. I'm involved with uh, Wisconsin Hop Cooperative. This is a group of Midwest area hop growers. Today we had a grower meeting. We're out at uh, Diwali Ridge Farm, one of our growers at the Wisconsin Hop Exchange, and visiting about agro agronomic things that we can do for next year to help our crop increase in quality and in volume. We had extension folks from around the state come out talking about fertilizer, watering, irrigation systems, how to plant hops, weeding. We were also talking about creating a state association to help really build the hop growing industry in Wisconsin. The acreage we have now is great, but we really are trying to get to that 100 acres to really create a sustainable business for the Wisconsin Hop Exchange. This serves our, our needs for being able to process and sell to local brewmasters in Wisconsin and the Midwest.
Every year at the end of August, we run the Simple Earth Hops Harvest Brew Fest. The idea is not only to enjoy ourselves and have fun and drink some beer, but we also, you know, try to talk about local hops. I'm Rich Joseph. I'm co-owner of Joseph Stout Hops out of Neosho, Wisconsin. Today we're here at Simple Earth Harvest. We're picking hop cones and being dried and then sent to the Wisconsin Hop Exchange. Harvest starts in this area about the middle of August and will continue to about the middle of September. This is the, the glamorous side of hop farming. The tinkering with the equipment, it takes so much effort to harvest that uh, on the small scale, there's really not a whole lot you can do. But that leaves you to hand harvesting. Then there's an intermediate level with a small scale, semi-automatic hop harvester. Then you move up to something like this, which is a, a used wolf harvester from Germany. This one has happened to be a 1973 vintage. It's used, and as you can see, it's heavily refurbished, and the guys are working on it right now because these things break down often and in imaginative ways. Uh, it requires uh, one to be a mechanic and a farmer in order to get things done. My name is uh, Mark Noble, I'm with the uh, Grumpy Trail Brew Pub in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin, and we are uh, buyers of locally grown and processed Wisconsin hops. We use pelletized hops from the Hop Exchange, and we decided to make a beer to highlight and specialize featuring these uh, wonderful hops called the Wisconsin Hop Farm Pale Ale. With the Hop Exchange, we're paying a little bit more, paying a premium on it, but also kind of help the get off the ground. And it's also, it's neat to say that the, this in this Hop Farm Pale Ale, we got hops that come from Dodgeville, um, Fort Atkinson, and um, Eau Claire. The development of this hop industry in the state is in its infancy because it's a highly capitalized industry just like brewing is. I applaud the Hop Exchange for, you know, setting up shop and trying to make this happen and develop the industry that helps local. A lot of folks like to buy and drink local. And some of our beers, like the Trailside Wheat, we probably only use about a pound and a half of German Northern Brewer hops. But as we work our way down the list, our Maggie Imperial IPA, when we make, when we make a 10 barrel batch, has about 25 pounds of hops in it. Um, Hopalop IPA might have about 18 pounds, and our Grumpy Crick Pale Ale is about eight pounds of hops. Besides for making beer, it's also used in a number of uh, food industries for its um, antibacterial properties, those being the cheese making industry. And it's also used in chicken feed. And it's also used in personal care products like deodorant, shampoo, soap. Um, a lot of people use it in teas. It's used for lactating mothers as a thing to stimulate a new mother's breastfeeding. Uh, they put it in hot pillows. And what it has is um, sedative properties. It was used in the past with medicinal purposes, a sore stomach, a headache, getting put in a tea form and consumed that way and it will make you very sleepy. My name is James Altweiss. I'm the uh, director and horticulturist of Gorse Valley Hops. Gorse Valley Hops is a group of growers 
that uh, are all focused on gathering enough quantity of hops to supply to a brewer. We have uh, several acres, several thousand pounds of production, and uh, that's finding its way into our Wisconsin craft beers. We are responsible here in this facility for processing all of the hops that our growers produce and dry and bring to us at the end of the season. Next week when we start processing, we'll take those whole flowers and we'll convey them up this auger system and the hammer mill system. We're gonna take those whole flowers and pulverize them and then compress them into very dense, small pellets that the brewers utilize in their brewing process. It's critical to do our own chemical testing so we have immediate turnaround and know when and if something is wrong with our product, we can hold it, we can fix it, and we can make sure that our quality is really up to par with what we're trying to give to our customers. My name is Anello Malika. I'm one of the owners of Central Waters Brewing Company. Uh, we've been around for 15 years. We've been pouring here at the Energy Fair for 14 of those 15 years. We've grown to be a, a nationally recognized brewery, both for quality of our beer and uh, for our efforts to try to shrink the footprint of our beer, environmentally speaking. That encompasses everything from using solar thermal, solar PV, and um, also trying to source all of our ingredients as locally as possible whenever we can. We're always faced with shortages of things like barley and hops, increased prices of hops and barley. One way to mitigate that is to try to source it locally and make sure that the local farmers are getting paid well for that crop. And if they're getting paid well, they'll keep growing it and that ensures a steady supply of the raw ingredients that we need to make beer. A few years back, uh, Central Waters was part of a group of breweries that started the Midwest Hops and Barley Co-op. I'm Russ Klisch. I'm president, founder, and owner of Lakefront Brewery. We are classified as a regional brewery, over 15,000 barrels. So we're one of five breweries in with Midwest Barley and Hop Co-op. It's us, Brecker, Central Waters, Bull Falls, and, and South Shore up in Ashland. And the five breweries have gotten together and kind of pledged to use Wisconsin ingredients in their beer. The reason of the co-op is that there's some farmers have really kind of gone a limb and spent a lot of money trying to put infrastructure in, and we thought that we'd guaranteed that we would buy hops from them no pun intended, we provided the seed money to the farmers to start planting hops and start planting barley and trying to get these things growing locally whenever and wherever we can. What I'd love to have is a beer and we could say everything in that glass is sourced within 10 miles of where, where we're drinking it. If we can buy locally, that's, that, that's a huge part of that footprint because you don't have to ship it so far to get it to the brewery. There's a farmer that's about two miles away from us, three miles away from us, and he plants brewer's barley uh, for us. We've been growing organic barley here for, I don't know, four or five years now, I guess. Uh, this is, I think, our fourth year that we'll, be, that we'll be selling our product to Central Waters Brewery for their shine on. Any small grain for food quality, you're trying to preserve the germination. So we've been checking the field here periodically and trying to find the sweet spot where we can get it to go through the combine but not letting it get too dry. The risk is if you let it get too dry in the field, you're subject to a lot more weather damage, a lot more uh, shattering with the, with the harvester as you go across the field. You lose more kernels on the ground, and, uh, but by harvesting a little bit higher moisture content, then we get more of the grain stays in the, in the machine. So barley will have a little husk over the kernel. Wheat, when you harvest it, the, the, the husk actually falls right off with the, with the threshing process. So. He grows it. Brees buys it from him, malts it specifically for us, but we're the only brewery that can buy that malt. What that does for us is it lets us make one beer, which is called Shine On, the same beer that we donate money back to this fair with, we make with locally grown barley year round. You're here with me at Vintage Brewing Company. We're on Madison's west side. I am the brewmaster and one of the partners. Welcome to my fermentation room. You may hear some gurgling in the background. We've actually got active fermentation in a couple of these vats right now. We're proud to use a lot of local ingredients here, not only for the food, but uh, in the brewing as well. So whenever it's been possible, try to source our grains locally and our hops locally too. Now hops is a lot easier these days to get them locally grown, locally processed. One of our, our key partners in that realm is Gorst Valley Hops. They're in Mazamani, which is about 30 miles west of us here in Madison. So another local partnership for us has been uh, Yahara Bay Distillers. We uh, like to do a lot of barrel aged beers here, generally stronger ales and they spend time in, in barrels, sometimes up to six months to a year. We've got some in bourbon style whiskey barrels and we're looking forward to getting some apple brandy barrels from Yahara Bay as well. A lot of fun things can be aged in spirits barrels. 
One of the things that, that's garnered us not just national acclaim but international acclaim for our beer is our barrel aging program. So we're the largest barrel aging brewery in the state, one of the top five or six largest barrel aging breweries in the entire nation. Right now there's a thousand bourbon barrels stacked up and aging with numerous different types of beer. These are beers that, that push the limit of what people expect from a beer. They're 12% alcohol, it's supposed to be poured in more of a wine glass at sort of wine temperatures. Wisconsin oftentimes gets overlooked for the quality of the beer in the state. Not a lot of Wisconsin breweries distribute their beer outside of the state, so we don't generally get known well internationally or even nationally for good beer because a lot of us stay within the state. Each little strain of yeast gives off different flavor profiles. Some can be smooth and sugary, others, others could make beer that's peppery and phenolic and have uh, fruit tones to it. Lakefront came out with the beer that all the barley was from the state of Wisconsin, all the hops were from the state of Wisconsin. They even cultivated a new yeast strain that was a Wisconsin-based yeast strain. That was the first time that it had ever happened. And what's great about them is they actually opened that strain up then to any other brewery that wants to use it. Back in 1516, they passed a law in Europe called the Reinheitsgebot, and it was to prevent unscrupulous brewers from putting cheaper ingredients in their beer. And you only had to, could make the beer with water, malt, and hops. In the 1500s, they didn't understand what really yeast was. They know they had to have it, but they didn't really talk about it as being a purity. One time I was at a brewing convention and there was a brewer from Belgium there and there was a brewer from California and the guy from California was kind of peppering the guy from Belgium with a bunch of questions about how he makes his beer, how he gets his yeast, how he puts his hops in because he was trying to copy what the Belgian was doing. And finally the Belgian guy kind of got fed up with him and said, why don't you just find your local ingredients and learn how to brew with them? And so I've always kind of looked for local yeast and I met Jeremy King who was running the homebrew supply store here in town and he, he had a PhD in microbiology from Purdue. And so I asked him, would it ever be possible to find a local yeast in the state of Wisconsin? And we didn't say much more, but then one day Jeremy uh, shows up at my doorstep and requests some of my Wisconsin grown grain. He took it back to his homebrew supply store, crushed the grain up, put it in a test tube, and just added some water. And it started to grow. And so there was something in there. It had to be some local yeast. And so after uh, growing up this yeast a little bit more, he was able to separate the bacteria from the yeast, brewed a batch of homebrew with it, and we thought it was an interesting flavor. It kind of tasted like a German Weiss beer. We then sent the yeast strain off to Y yeast to be purified and grown, and uh, that's how the Wisconsinite was born. The barley was grown up around Wild Rose and was malted by Malt Europe here in, in Milwaukee. Uh, the hops either come from Wausau or from around Mazamani, uh, just west of, of Madison. We have local water that's here, and a fourth ingredient is the yeast. The yeast is one of the main ingredients that people really don't look at that much on the flavors they're getting in the beer come from the yeast. Uh, there's some parts of the world that are famous for their yeast, one being Belgian. Uh, they use a lot of local yeast, and when they do that, uh, they get different sour flavors, other characteristic flavors that they, they have. We reuse all of our strains of yeast about 10 times here, then they start to mutate uh, a little bit there. They can get mutations in there and change. You can keep on going there, but then you get a little bit more house flavor into the beer. I'm Robin Kling. I'm one of the founders of Craft Beer Week in Madison, Wisconsin. And I also run a group called The Femmes, the females enjoying microbrews, and just a general beer lover and home brewer. I used to have a job where I traveled around the country, and I ended up going to a lot of other cities that had craft beer weeks, and I had such a good time at them. I was like, man, why doesn't Madison have one of these? I heard that Bill Rogers had the same idea. So he and I started working together, and then we got Jeff Glazer on board, and we just got together and launched it mostly for fun. I'm hoping that for people who are currently craft beer lovers and craft beer connoisseurs that they get to try a bunch of new cool rare beers, maybe go to some release parties. For people who don't really know craft beer or aren't currently craft beer drinkers, I hope that they go out to the bars and maybe dabble their toes a little bit and start to get more and more involved. 
But we try to make sure that there's a really good range of events, at least one Beer 101 event every time, and then everything from beer and food pairings to sour blending classes and aging classes and things like that. Last year, Scott Manning, the brewer of Vintage, approached me and said, hey, what do you think about us doing a collaboration beer for Craft Beer Week? I was like, oh my God, that'd be awesome. So he started contacting the other brewers in the area, and we love it. It's, it's a really fun idea, and people around the city of Madison are really into it. We're here at Capital Brewery. This is our Common Thread Brew Day. We're brewing a beer to guard, which is a French ale style. Common Thread is a collaboration. Ten different breweries represented in today's collaboration brew. How did it get started? We, over a couple of beers, of course. We sort of got the idea of why couldn't we do something special for Madison Craft Beer Week. Common Thread is using malt from South Shore, which is uh, Ashland, Wisconsin. We've also got our specialty malts from Brees Malting. They're in Chilton, Wisconsin. And our hops are from uh, Gorse Valley in Mazomani. So we're keeping everything local. We're using a sugar addition to this brew as well, but in lieu of uh, cheap adjunct sugar, we're actually going to add local Wisconsin honey from Frank Holtzman. He's also in uh, Mazomani. It's really a collaboration brew that celebrates all Wisconsin has to offer and um, gives back to the state too. We're donating proceeds of Common Thread to the Wisconsin Brewers Guild. Many of us participant brewers are members. Also, this will help to benefit small brewers like us statewide by giving to the organization that um, supports our causes and really sticks up for us. We're gonna take our grain, we're gonna put it in the hopper, then the auger is gonna transfer it all the way up into the mill, and the mill is gonna actually crack the grain open so that we can get at the, the starches inside there and then it gets transferred from the mill up into the mash tun where it mixes with hot water so we can extract the, the sugars from there. And once that's done mashing, it gets transferred over into the lauder tun. There's a false bottom in there that's gonna help leave behind all the grain and husk material so we can just get the sugar water out of there. The sugar water's gonna get transferred into the boil kettle where we'll boil and add the hops. And from there it gets cooled down and sent into the fermenters. That's where we'll add the yeast and it'll, it'll sit and ferment in condition and end up with beer. Charlie Mops, a man who invented beer, he invented beer.